Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. Susan, Sunday morning, honestly, I couldn't tell you the title of what you talk about, what you talked about, which is, that's all right. Um, but she, she ministered out of Mark 9 about the father with the demon-possessed son. And, oh, if you're taking notes, the title tonight, I've almost forgot. I'm just, I'm fired up. Man, the title, is the, the title tonight is The Call of Fellowship. The Call of Fellowship. And it went off inside of me because religion makes that whole story about the demon-possessed son. Yeah. You know, they've even come up with stuff that said, oh, he, had, he was, the son was epileptic, so he was demon-possessed, which is the biggest lie of all times because there's, I've met plenty of epileptic people who were filled with the Holy Ghost, so that's a lie. But, um, <laughs> which is not the point, but the point of it all was is, Religion says it's about the demon-possessed son when Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. It's not about any of that. It's about faith and it's about fellowship. It's about faith and it's about fellowship. And it's interesting because at the beginning of this, the disciples brought the boy to Jesus because they weren't able to cast the demon out of this young man. They were not able to do it. Why? We don't know why. It does, well, yeah, we do. They had little faith. That's why. But why did they have little faith? Why, why was their faith not great? What was the reason for this? Fellowship. They were with Jesus all the time. But if you think about it, these boys had grown up in probably one of the most religious cultures of, 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 of human history. In a culture that, that said it's not about how much, it's not whether you know the Father or not. You're, how, how do I word this? Your level of importance in society is based upon how much you know about the Father. That, I mean, that's what they built their lives on. The Pharisees were the Pharisees, and they carried so much pride because they knew the most about God. They had the most head knowledge about the Father. They knew all about Him. Jesus said in Mark 9, 29, He said, This kind can only be cast out by prayer. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation can only be cast out by prayer. And, it's, and you mentioned this Sunday morning, you said that in the original Greek, it, well, yeah, Greek or Aramaic, it was, fasting was never in that. That it was added by the writers of the King James Version, which is crazy because it, it's just, they're trying to slip actions into what God can do. How, they're trying to slip how our actions affect how God responds to us. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions in the Christian faith is that God responds to us based upon our actions. God does not respond to us based upon our actions. He responds to us based upon our heart. He responds to you not because of your actions. He responds to you based upon your heart. And we're going to dive into that later. So this, this message may really mess with a lot of our religion tonight. Um, if it does, praise God. <laughs> That's awesome. This kind can only be cast out by prayer. What is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is communication with the Father. And, and when I say communication, I'm not, this is not business meeting communication. All right, here's this, here's this, here's this. Lined out, done, let's go. That's not prayer. That's not communication with the Father. 
communication with the Father looks a whole lot more like fellowship. Our prayer life should look less like us listing off our checklist of things we got to get prayed for and more like sitting in the presence of the Father, letting His hand be on us. And until He removes it, until it says, all right, then we go. But religion has so itemized and so structuralized something that, that, that the Father never meant to be structured or, or, or itemized. You can't structure God. You, we can't structure our way into the presence. And it's wild because it, in the Jewish culture, which was filled with so much structure, it's like the only way I look at it is Jesus took a baseball bat to their mirror of structure and said, here's how you see yourself. Let me just crush that for you right quick. That's why they wanted to kill him because he destroyed everything they thought they knew. The call of fellowship. The reality is, is God wants to fellowship with you every day. God wants you to experience internal revival every day. God doesn't want us to have an incredible moment at the altar and then go live from, from that moment for the rest of our lives. God wants you to have an incredible moment when you spend time with Him daily and daily live from that moment every day. I'm going to say that again because that was really good. And if you didn't write that down, I'm sorry. But God did not call us to live from one moment where it was just amazing in service. He has called us to live from the daily encounter, the daily revival that He has for us. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. They're not new when you just got saved. They're new every morning. So whenever we come into the presence of God, He has mercy for us that day. That day, day by day. And in our humanity, I think we often go to the Father because we're, we're trying to be good. I'm going to go to God because I, I need to be a good Christian and go pray. <laughs> We don't go to God to be good. We go to God because He is good. Because we're not, apart from God, we're not good. Apart from the Father, apart from who Jesus is inside of us, we're not good. But with Him, we are good. With Him, with His goodness inside of us, we can actually walk out the true definition of goodness on this earth. Is this, is this ministering to you all tonight? This went off inside of me, man. We come to the Father not to be good, but because He is good. God is, just like God is love. Haven't you heard God described as God is love? Raise your hand if you've heard. Okay, just as God is love. God is good. He is the definition of good. He is the de very definition of it. And we go to Him through fellowship to partake of His goodness. To partake of what He has for us. Through fellowship and encounter, faith is increased. And it's hard to step into fellowship until you understand how God sees you. I'm, I'm laying groundwork right now for, for the rest of what we're going to talk about tonight. I want to lay some groundwork for fellowship. God is not a judge waiting with gavel in hand to condemn you. 
And a lot of times when we think of God, how many of you were raised to think of God as waiting to hit you with a lightning bolt? Waiting to just catch you when you're not looking. What, God, that's, how many of you were brought up to see God as compassion? Yeah, if you're raised in this church, that's for sure. How, how many of you were raised up to see God as good father? See, when we go to fellowship with him, we have to understand he's not waiting to condemn us for our sin. He's looking to free us from what hinders the fellowship with him. Mm. God is not waiting to condemn you for your sin. He's waiting to free you from the bondage of sin that hinders fellowship between you and him. And our identity crisis isn't in how we, how, how we see God, it's in how God sees us. And when you understand how the Father sees you, when you understand that He is so in pursuit of you, All of a sudden, that sin that hinders that fellowship will become distasteful. When Emily Lankford was here, when your daughter was here, Ken, she talked about this vision she had had where she saw the face of Jesus. I don't know if she's told you this or not. <laughs> it was amazing. And Jesus, in that vision, she said, he asked her, do you, or do you really want to see my face? She said, yes. This is back there. This is, my service was going on. We're back in the bridge room. Just having a moment with the Lord. She said, and she said no, do you really want to see my face? She said, Jesus said, do you really want to see my face? He said, he asked her about three times. And she said, yes, I really want to see your face. And then her response to him was, you will be ruined for everything else. God wants to ruin you for everything that keeps you from fellowship. He wants, he literally wants to make sin look distasteful. And religion has said that there's always just a little bit of humanity that we just want to go back into sin. No, no, no. Either God freed us from it or he didn't. And if he freed us from it, then I never have to go back to it. If he freed me from addiction, I never have to go back to it. If he freed me from lust, I never have to go back to it. To the point where when the temptation comes into my view, it will look distasteful. But that mindset is not gained from working and doing and being good and trying all these things that's only gained from fellowship but until you realize that God's not waiting to judge you you'll never go to him in fellowship because you you will let the very thing that he's trying to eliminate keep you from his goodness Whew. I don't know if you felt that <laughs> my lord I'm gonna take a drink of water The father of the demon-possessed son. Well, he's not demon-possessed anymore. He's free. Um, the father of the now-freed son had to see Jesus not as judge, but as a loving healer. Compassion flowed from Jesus, not judgment. And let me paint this picture for you. The, here, here was the culture of the day. Here was the culture of, of that time. They, be, they literally believed that the sins of the parents were placed upon the children. So imagine what life was like for that father. Imagine the looks he got walking down the street and his son or 
is throwing himself into a fire. His son is going into a fit of rage, destroying things. And they're sitting back, not judging the son, but the father. So the father goes to the disciples and said, Can you heal my son? They try, they fail. Let's take you to Jesus. My opinion, 100% my opinion. I wonder in the moment when they said, let's go to Jesus, because Jesus was a well-known teacher. He was not an obscure figure. When he came out of his ministry, when Jesus stepped into ministry after he was baptized in the River Jordan, he was, he was a very well-known, term of the day, he was a well-known rabbi. So I'm willing to bet that father knew exactly who he was. And in that moment when the disciples said, all right, well, let's just take you to Jesus, I'm willing to bet there was a little bit of apprehension in him because he's like, what if he condemns me for my sin instead of healing my son? What if instead of seeing, what if instead of having compassion, he carries the gavel? And we have to face that. We have to make that decision in our minds every day. When God calls us to fellowship, the little voice in our head says, why go? Because he's just going to tell me how not good I'm doing. He's just going to tell me how unpleasing he is with me. I know I've messed up, so why go? Because he wants to fully heal us from what hinders us. Mm. Again, my opinion. Take it for what it is. I think the Father asked if Jesus... Let me read. Let me read first. Let me set some groundwork. Mark 9, 21. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The Spirit often throws him to the fire or into the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us. Interesting. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. My opinion. I don't, believe, I don't think the Father asked Jesus if he could because he wasn't sure he could heal him. I think, G, I think the Father knew that Jesus was well capable of healing him. I think the Father asked if he could because he didn't know if Jesus would do it. He wasn't sure if he was good enough to receive that level of grace and mercy. And it's some messed up theology if we think we have to be good enough to receive God's goodness and mercy. That's exactly what it is. And if you've been taught that, I am sorry. Because that's a lie. Through desire for information and religious dogma, the reality of the will of the Father was lost because what the Father and Son needed could only come through fellowship. The freedom that the Father needed could only come because of fellowship. The freedom that the Son needed could only come through fellowship. How often are we trying to release a level of faith that we are not capable of yet because we are trusting in what we know to do instead of trusting in who we know? Faith. 
Faith is not a trust in the process. Faith is a trust in the Father. If you're trusting in a process to heal you, you're trusting in something that can't. Only the Father can. Faith is not a process. Faith is a trust of, a, of God. That's what it is. It's not a one, two, three. It's a, no, I actually believe what you said. And because you said it, it's mine. That's faith. Not, all right, I'm going to confess these scriptures, and because I confessed, then I, I've done the right things. I believe in confessing scriptures. Don't, don't, don't mistake me here. And because I've read my word, and because I've lifted my hands in worship, because I've done one, two, and three, then I'll be healed. No, 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 it's because I believe what he said. That's where my healing's at. If you don't believe what he said, mm. great faith believe, great faith believed what Jesus would say. No faith trusted in a process. I believe that the that the disciples were trusting in a process to remove that demon from that boy. And their process failed them. Mm. Faith is a trust in the Father. Faith is trust that what He said is truth. Not just true, but, what, but the actual truth. What the Father has spoken through His Word is actual, the truth. It's the foundation for all truth. My response to that is, Father, help my unbelief. <laughs> help my unbelief. I need that mercy. I need that grace. I need that fellowship. Because there's some days I wake up and it looks impossible. Whatever faces us looks impossible. And it's through fellowship that I'm reminded that it is possible. It's through fellowship that I'm reminding, reminded that the Father, He is unfailing. He is unwavering. He's never ceasing. He's compassionate. It's through fellowship that I understand that all His promises are yes and amen. I can trust Him because I know Him. I trust the Father because I know Him. Not because I know about Him. There's a lot of people I know about that I, I do not trust. I know about a lot of people, and I have no trust in them. Not because they're bad people, because I don't know them. But my wife, I know. So I trust my wife. Not your niece, my wife. <laughs> oh, man. Sunday. Sunday is mine and my wife's one year anniversary. Mm. Man, time flies. It's been a good one year. It's been great. I don't know. How long, does, how long do people say the honeymoon, honeymoon phase lasts? What's, did, well, forever. 18 years? There you go. Yeah, I don't, I don't see an end in sight. Praise God. Yeah, it's not because of me. She's amazing. <laughs> I know my wife and I have a full trust in her. Why? Because of intimacy. Because I have a deep knowing of her. I believe this. I believe it's the Father's goal for us is not to have great faith. I believe the Father's goal for us is to walk in intimacy with Him. And from the depth of that intimacy, great faith is produced. It's from the depth of, what, of how much we know Him, not how much we know about Him. Know about? No. It's not about what we know about Him. It's, what, it's, what we, it's how we know Him. 
faith was never designed to be apart from fellowship. We will never walk in the fullness of faith unless we walk in fellowship. Knowing about him is not enough. The demons know about him. If knowing about him was enough, then the Pharisees and Jewish law would have been the peak of it all. Because they knew all about him. I mean, they had him lined out. They knew, him. they knew about him. They could tell you all about him. But Jesus destroyed everything that was sacred to them. He actually said this. He said, <laughs> Jesus said this about the Pharisees. Jesus replied, this is out of Matthew 15, verse 3. You don't have to turn there. Jesus replied, and why do you know, and, and why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I vowed to give to God what I had given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents, and so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commandments from God. The Father desires not for us to be out behaving correctly, but for our hearts to be fully captured by his goodness. And righteous living is just the fruit of that. Doing good is a fruit of fellowship. It's not the means to it. I can't stress this enough. Doing good is not how we get to fellowship. It's the fruit of it. It all started with His goodness. Not our obedience. Mm. Man. John 15 verse 1 y'all go ahead and turn there John 15 1 I'll give y'all time John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I, am, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. We can believe in the authority of our words because of the authority of who we're connected to. We can believe that when we lay hands on the sick, they shall recover because of who we're connected to. It's 
It's God's desire that we abide. It's God's desire that you sit with Him and learn from Him and know Him. Jesus said this, He said, they will come to me and they say, we did all these things in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We healed the sick in your name. And then Jesus said, and I will look at them and say, get away from me. for I don't know you. His desire, that, that's not to scare us. That, it's to show his desire. God's, the Father's desire is to know you and for you to know him. I mean, that was the garden, right? The garden was nothing but continual fellowship with the Father. And from that continual fellowship, earth was cultivated. Fruit was produced. God's desire for Adam was not for Adam to to do all the right things and then come to him showing that he's done all the right things. God's desire for Adam was just to be with him and live from the fullness of God here on earth. And what's wild is through the death of his son and through the shedding of his blood, the fullness of God in us is now, ex- is now capable. Jesus came and restored garden fellowship. Why? So we can restore earth to garden fellowship. Our responsibility is not is not to, man, how do I word this? Uh, Our responsibility is not to do all the right things. Our responsibility is to make earth look like heaven. Because the reality is, is whenever our heart is so consumed by him, when, 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 whenever we are, when our chief obsession, when I say chief obsession, I mean our chief obsession, the thing that just fuels us and drives us and carries us on, our chief obsession is to be fellowship. It, it, it's to be the heart of the Father. That's our chief obsession. And whenever that's our chief obsession, everything else falls into place. Because if we don't put the Father in the right place, then nothing else is lined up. And I'm all for having a house and, and, and being blessed and living blessed. But the American dream is not our chief obsession. I'm not saying that you can't have it. I'm just saying is, are we living for it or are we obsessed with the Father? There's a lot of people that live physically rich but spiritually poor. There's a lot of people who sit in church that live physically rich but spiritually poor. God designed us to be wealthy physically and spiritually. And I believe that we can't have true physical riches until we have true spiritual riches. I believe that the poverty of spirit will drive us to poverty of the physical. We can work our way into so many things, but there's only certain things that are obtained by the grace of God. And I, I love a good day's work. I love sweating. It's weird. I know. <laughs> and and it, it fills me up, but nothing fills me like sitting with the Father. And nothing annoys me than sitting with nothing to do. Because that's, that's, the, that's, the, <laughs> that's the dichotomy that we have to deal with is that in the midst of fellowship, it looks like we're not producing anything. But we've got to be convinced that the production is not just what we see with our eyes, it's what we know with our heart. And the reality is, is whenever we 
put our obsession with the Father in its right place, you'll actually see more productivity brought out in your life than when you weren't. Because working from a place of rest, there ain't nothing like it. I've gone to work anxious. And you can ask my boss. It's not a good day. It's not a good day for anyone. But when we go to work full of him, that's a pretty good day. We may face obstacles. Things may happen. We figure out a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. But how can you hear what the way is if you don't understand that his will for you is rest? I believe in the... Because if you read in Genesis... I, man, I don't want to ramble on, but this is just so real right now. If you read in Genesis, when Adam sinned, and the curse that came because of that, the, God said, Adam, you will now produce from the sweat. The ground will now produce from the sweat on your back. So I believe in the middle of Adam cultivating earth cultivating the garden what looked what would from the outside looking in would look like work was actually the greatest thing ever and in the middle of rest if we're going to be if you're going to be more productive living in rest you have to understand that rest isn't just not doing anything rest is where you're at in here rest is freedom from anxiety rest is freedom from the weight of stress. It's the ability to shut off the mind of everything that's gone wrong in the day and have a good night's sleep. It's all in fellowship, guys. The words you say, fellowship. If we watch our words when we're around certain people, why don't we understand that we can just watch our words all the time because we're always around God. Fellowship. Hmm. Go to Luke 15, verse 11. The story of the prodigal son, we've all heard this. Um, and I think it is, this is more of a story of fellowship than it is a, a story of a son who went away and did bad things and then came back. If all we, again, man, religion has made this story about the son who did bad things. It's not about that. It's about the father who just wants to be with his sons. Anyways. Mm parable of the lost son. Luke 15, 11. To illustrate, illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. How hungry do you have to be? Good Lord. <laughs> but no one gave him anything. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses... He said to himself, At home, even the hired servants had food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against, sinned against both you and heaven, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. How many times do we do that? Pause. How many times do we go to God and we're just like, I'm so sorry, God. I don't, I don't deserve anything you have to give me. I'm unworthy. And God's like, stop, stop. Son, put on my robe wear my ring, advance the kingdom. Yeah. 
partake in my goodness. Anyways, I digress. Verse 20. So he, he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it onto him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. I think it's funny that the father looked right through the son trying to earn his way back. He looked right through it and said, Your son, you're just back, period. Right where you were. See, the Father doesn't look at us when we, when we sin, when we mess up. The Father doesn't look at us and say, all right, you've got to go back to where you started. Bad Christian. How dare you? <laughs> it's not what he says. He said, no, no, no. You come here, I'm going to embrace you. That, the, man. And I can only imagine when Jesus is telling this story, there were probably audible gasps in the crowd. Because he's speaking to a bunch of Jewish men and women and the thought of pork disgusted them. And this son had been feeding the pigs and eating what the pigs ate. And the father went and embraced the son just and kissed him. Yeah, audible gasp. Why? Because Jesus is breaking down every wall of religion. And the reality is, is Jesus wants to break down every wall of religion, every wall that says you have to earn your way to his goodness. He wants to break all that down and say, no, 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 just come partake. Come drink from my cup. Come eat from my table. I've killed the fatted calf for you. We're having a party because you're home. We're not here judging you because you've sinned. And it was only in fellowship. Okay, I'm not going to go there. I'll read that later. I'll go there later. Verse 22, but his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fat, fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you. Never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with all my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes... You celebrate by killing, by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed with me, and, have, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. You know the older son was just as lost as the younger son in that story? Just as lost. I actually think the older son was more lost, personally. It was the father's desire to fellowship with the sons, both of them. And it was only through fellowship that the sons could step in to what the father really had for them. Look at it like this. The father is, I'm, I imagine a mansion because he has many servants and they don't go hungry, so he's very well off. And he was able to give his son his inheritance before he died. So he's, Pop's doing good. <laughs> I see it like this. I see a, a large home with, with two or three floors. And I see the father on the top floor 
looking out two windows, pacing back and forth across the room. Out one window, he sees his beautiful driveway, hoping to see his son come over the horizon one day, who is in a distant land. And I believe out the other window, he looked to see his older son working and toiling away, hoping to see him look up and make a beeline for the house. The father's desire for both, one, for both sons was to fellowship with him. His desire was to have them up in that third floor room, painting the picture of what it's going to look like the day that they take over the family business. See that grove over there? Try that with that. Let me show you how to do this. Here's how to maintain and keep happy servants. Here's how to do all these things. Come partake in my goodness, son. Let me show you what it means to be the father. That was the father's desire for both sons. One son was just going to fill himself with something that could never fill him. The other son was trying to work his way into the father's approval. He said it himself. I've done all these things for you and never once have you killed a fatted calf for me. In other words, that says, I've worked and worked and worked, and do you not approve of me? And the, the older son represents the church because a lot of times we can sit in these pews and say, I've worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. God, do you not approve of me? God's like, absolutely, I approve of you. Do you not want a fellowship with me? And for both sons, the only way to f true freedom was fellowship. It's the only way. God's desire for us is fellowship. That's it. And from that, everything else flows. From that right there, everything else flows. A lot of people say, I've tried the faith message and it never worked. No, they, didn't. they tried to say the right things. They just missed fellowship. Yeah. The faith message works because we fellowship. Faith works. It's not, it's not a message, it's what it is. Faith works, period, because we fellowship. It's in fellowship that the weight of what we are facing in the physical becomes nothing. It's in fellowship where he can show us the victory before it's ever manifested in the physical. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Amen. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So tonight, you're sitting here on this Wednesday night, middle of the week. You've made it through Monday. Tuesdays come and went. What are you carrying that you were not designed to care, carry? See, if we're carrying the weight of the world, we're carrying something that we were not designed for. And I can pull a lot of heavy things with my truck, but if I try to pull an 18-wheeler with my truck, I'm going to tear it apart because that truck was not designed to carry that weight. Just like you're not designed to carry the weight of the world. Instead of the weight of the world, we're called to carry glory. Instead of anything else, we're called to carry His love. We're called to carry victory. We're called to carry goodness. We're called to carry rest. But He can never give us those things outside of fellowship. It's through fellowship. 
it's, it's in fellowship that the, that the mountains melt like, melt like wax before the Father. Mm. It's where he shows us who he is. The Father is consumed by having your heart. He's not consumed with you behaving correctly. Correctly, Christianity is not just a path to good behavior. Christianity is not what it is. Again, righteous behavior is just fruit of fellowship. God's way more interested in having your heart. He wants this. Why? Well, it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So if he's got it, you're going to be speaking him. Mm. If he's got your heart, he's got everything else. That's all he wants from you. What does God want from me? Your heart. Because when you give him that, he's got everything. Mm. So my question is, how is tomorrow going to look different for you? Because of fellowship, how is tomorrow going to look different for you? I hope this ministered to you tonight. I hope it challenged you tonight. I hope you came in here with some weight and you now understand how to get rid of that and how to give it to the right person. And I hope you understand that through fellowship that you can have great faith. God wants to know you. And he wants you to know him, not just about him. He wants you to know him. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.